Hello and good evening to everyone, wherever you are in the world. This is our third edition of Speaking with Gert van den Bosch. Now, it, two months is a long time in social media. The very first time I spoke to him was on the 6th of March, and a lot has happened in that time. Who could have predicted that when we had that first conversation, that that video would be seen by millions of people across the world and still being watched? So it's been quite an incredible journey. And so with great pleasure, I will bring with you, Gert, how are you? I'm fine, uh, Philip, so far. Uh, yes. For having me uh, a third time. A third time, yes. So listen, Gert, I think it's still important in case nobody knows who you are. Mm -hmm. You are a vaccine expert. You research, you develop vaccines. You have worked with multiple companies across the world. You've worked on the Ebola virus. You've worked with Gavi. You've worked with the Gates Foundation. You are one of the top of the line vaccine experts. And this is what's confusing people. Why would you ever say anything that is not pro-vaccine? Well, it's, I mean, it is, uh, my, my point is, well, uh, as, as you said yourself, I'm not, uh, not at all an anti-vaxxer. The only thing I'm saying is that uh, these uh, vaccines are uh, not appropriate for use in a pandemic of a highly mutable virus, uh, certainly not used at, at large scale, and, uh, and especially when used in the heat of the pandemic. So it's not about uh, the vaccines themselves. Uh, I, I basically reiterate my statement uh, months ago. I maintain that uh, these vaccines have been developed by brilliant people. And, um, you know, it's not uh, my role and my field of uh, expertise or uh, specialty to discuss uh, potential side effects and um, you know, uh, safety issues, uh, etc. We we know these uh, vaccines have uh, been licensed under emergency use, so uh, that basically means that uh, the risk, uh, you know, with these vaccines is uh, higher than normal and outside the pandemic. And uh, I'm not saying that everything has been uh, handled. Uh, uh, properly and adequately, but uh, that is, of course, the responsibility and, uh, according to my understanding, also the liability of uh, regulatory and, and health authorities, especially also uh, the WHO. But um, as far as these vaccines are concerned, uh, my, my, or my concern has been primarily uh, to see, well, could the use of these vaccines have detrimental effects uh, on the population level? And, and that has been uh, my point because, because I think in this situation, we cannot simply stick to the mantra of, uh, you know, vaccination being, and that is what we hear all the time, the more you vaccinate, the lower the infectious pressure is going to be so the lower the number of uh, disease cases and the lower the number of variants. So that is the mantra of vaccination that is currently stated and that is driving these mass vaccination campaigns. And uh, for a number of reasons, I think this is simply incredibly simplistic because even if we vaccinate uh, people and especially the vulnerable groups, the question always is, well, yes, we will have an effect on the infectious pressure, of course, when we vaccinate. I'm, I've never been saying that this is not dramatically reducing the viral load. But my question is, and my focus of research has been, but what is the impact? What could possibly be the impact of changing the infectious pressure in the target population, the vulnerable people that you vaccinate? What could possibly be the effect, the consequences of this on non-vaccinated people that have been previously asymptomatically infected, uh, for example. And, and that is an important point because the asymptomatic, I would say, Philip, frankly speaking, for me, there is three things that have been missing in this discussion of the pandemic. All the role of asymptomatic, uh, asymptomatically infected people. Uh, 
who I think are really a reservoir for breeding variants. And I can come to this and, and speak to this more in detail. The second thing has been the, um, the ignorance about the uh, about immune escape in a sense that um, I think the situation is promoting the propagation of uh, immune escape variants. So we know that these immune escape variants, uh, you know, you have them all the time, they emerge all the time. It's not about this, it's about how is, is, there, is it possible that through suboptimal uh, immune conditions, uh, conditions of suboptimal pressure, you select those variants and you promote their propagation, for example, in the population, then th this is a problem. And the third thing that has been missing completely is the role in the contribution of innate immunity. So now, frankly speaking, I think if you don't understand these three contributions, it is impossible to understand what is going on in this pandemic. And frankly speaking, that is what we're seeing right now. Uh, health authorities do no longer understand what is going on. Nobody dares to, to make any prognostic, uh, any prognosis. Uh, nobody dares you know, to say, for example, uh, how is this going to end? And the mass vaccination, the final, the end game of the mass vaccination was herd immunity. Uh, is somebody standing up, some health authority and saying, well, guys, we will have herd immunity, for example, in two years from now, we will take, we will have all the infectious variants under control. This whole pandemic will be reduced and degraded to a kind of seasonal disease, uh, a kind of common cold, and this will not cost uh, many more lives. And it will end within the next two years. I, I think that would be a reasonable statement to make if you go for mass vaccination. Nobody, nobody is doing this because simply the pandemic is and where it is going is no longer understood for fundamental, for fundamental lack of understanding of a number of important factors that are determining and shaping the course of this pandemic. Now, oh. let, let, let's just check something here, Bert, because you started speaking about this in March. Mm. I have seen a few people challenge what you're saying. And if, if you want to read a lot of what Gert has said, it's on his website, quite detailed, frequently asked questions. But I have not heard anybody at a very senior level come out in support of what you're saying. But at the same time, I have not heard anybody come out at that level to say, no, you're wrong. Why is that? What is going on? Well, uh, I don't know exactly, Philip. First of all, let's be very open and serious about this. This is very, very complex, very, very complex. And uh, I, I mean, the, the, the pandemic and, uh, you know, uh, right now, the, the, the impact of, of mass vaccination, of uh, global uh, infection prevention measures, etc. So does that mean that, uh, you know, I'm more intelligent than anybody else? Certainly not. But I must say, I have taken a deep dive into this because I was from the very beginning very suspicious and I felt that something was not wrong. It was not right. Sorry. And, and then, of course, uh, you know, some experts will take a deep dive and spend day and night on this and not leave any turn, any stone unturned till they have found it. And others will probably stick to the mantra of vaccination and saying, well, the more we vaccinate, the lower the infectious pressure, the, the, the less cases, the fewer cases of disease and, and, and the less the likelihood that the variants will appear. But I do think, and I am under the impression from some uh, very few comments that I've gotten from key experts that somebody really realize that I know what I'm talking about, that it is, it may be an issue, that I do have a point. And I must say, uh, I've been calling several different times on the WHO and, and, you know, on experts to have this discussion on these topics like, what is the contribution of innate immunity? What, uh, what is the likelihood that uh, uh, immune escape variants could propagate and start to, uh, to dominate? What is the role of the asymptomatically uh, infected people in this? 
and th th there is simply no response, no feedback whatsoever. But so what I would it. like to do uh, yeah, is simply yeah. to say, look, guys, because uh, you know my purpose, the purpose was to have this call and this discussion in advance. So in order to be able to still intervene and to avoid bad things, since there is no response to this, I mean, I think I've done my homework. I put as much as I could on my on my website. Unfortunately, we are now we have now come to the point where we have to wait and see. And what I'm saying is, look, these are my predictions based on the way I understand this and on the way it makes, scientifically speaking, for me, sense. These are my predictions. Where are yours, right? Yeah. So let, let me understand something, Gert. Have you ever done anything like this before? Because this is a very difficult thing to do. You are challenging the industry that you are working in. Is this something that you would have done at a different stage of your career? Because this is kind of like the things that can permanently damage your career. That is true. But uh, as, I, as I've been mentioning a number of times, whatever people may, uh, may, may say about me or tell about me, uh, for me, this is a moral obligation. And if you're serious about a moral obligation, that means that, you know, no matter where you are employed, no matter you know what contracts you're bound by, uh, no matter whom you're depending on or, or, or reporting to, you have to do these things. And I mean, look, uh, this is now the key topic in, in, in all the news for months and months, for over one year, right? With a huge impact on, on all kinds of, of, of different aspects of human life. And, and then if, if you are a virologist and a vaccine, you are in this field and you are interested in this and, and you do these investigations and you come to things that enable you to explain what is happening and to even anticipate this, how then can you shut your mouth? I, I, I you know, I, I couldn't. I couldn't. And of course, now I'm in a more comfortable situation than a couple of years ago, maybe, where I was still uh, employed in, in, in Big Pharma, etc. But, but still, uh, even uh, working there, I was uh, from time to time, and people who know me uh, know that I'm telling the truth. I was uh, raising my voice when things uh, you know, went wrong and when I detected uh, things that I thought were very, very important and uh, could lead to, uh, to, to huge is issues. But of course, never ever at the scale uh, of this issue, right? Yeah, I can understand. So yes, that is a very important point. So yes, and, and you, we have to credit what you're doing. I, I mean, it's very difficult for people who are not experts themselves to be able to understand the nuances of what you're talking about. But it's clear, one, that you have expertise, to the people who have challenged what you have said, you seem to have been able to refute it relatively easily. And nobody at the very senior level of any of the big organizations have come out and said that you are wrong. Do you think at the moment with what is happening across the world, can you explain what the differences are between what's happening, say, for instance, in the UK and Israel versus, is, um, say, India versus, you know, the USA, what is going on and why do we see such a different picture in different mm. parts of the world? Mm. So, um, without may maybe at this point uh, showing the graphs, we can maybe show them uh, later on, but let me first uh, try to explain this in as simple words as I can, as I can possibly find to phrase this. Um, if we look, for example, at the situation in, in, in let's say, uh, Uruguay or uh, Brazil, Chile, Chile, they are right now vaccinating on a background of uh, pretty high infectious pressure. So when Chile started to vaccinate, um, they uh, were basically vaccinating uh, while an infectious wave was uh, was just coming up. And um, there is one thing that I've explained several different times, that is 
if you have an infection the first wave, a number of people, actually, the majority of the population will be asymptomatically infected, right? And those people do not develop, most of those people do not develop a full-fledged uh, immune response, a full-fledged B cell response, full-fledged antibodies. Uh, when I mean full-fledged, it's long-lived and it's memory. And I know people have been scrutinizing this, etc. But uh, I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting for a report showing that there is B cell memory elicited or built in people who got asymptomatically infected. So that means that the antibodies that those people are developing, and there is a number of several uh, different reports that say that even after eight weeks, these antibodies are no longer detectable. And they are, so they are short-lived. And for me, it's not a real priming because there is no B cell memory, at least not has not been reported. So in other words, these antibodies are suboptimal, but they do bind to the spike protein. And this has been my argument all along, as they bind to the spike protein with higher affinity than the natural antibodies the IgMs can do, they are capable of outcompeting or at least suppressing, suppressing natural immunity. So if now during this very period in time where your natural antibodies are suppressed, you get reinfected with the virus, that can have bad consequences because your innate immunity is suppressed and your suboptimal antibodies will not be sufficiently functional to protect you. Can I, uh, can I, can I jump in here a minute, um, Gert? Because one of the things that I've been looking at, um, which is very unusual about not just this virus, but all three of the coronaviruses, the COV-1, you could call it, uh, MERS and COV-2, they are largely, I, I use the word benign viruses, meaning that when you compare it to say Ebola or even the flu, they don't kill infants with poor immune systems, okay? And so one of the most critical things is that they avoid the interferon detection and the, the models that they have used in animals, say in rats and so on, they found that the delayed interferon is what caused a lot of, of problems. And if that is the case, mucosal immunity is probably the most important thing for this virus, as opposed to almost any other one, because it will send the signal with the interferon signal that the virus is present. I would question whether or not people who are asymptomatically infected who have got the, um, the epitopes in the mucosa would necessarily be at any significant risk, even for variants. Uh, so you mean they are not at risk? Well, it's just that if you have the mucosal immunity, and it, this is what I'm saying, is this is what's different about this virus as opposed to say an Ebola virus. This virus, when it gets down into the lungs, if you have got interferon, it doesn't seem to cause severe disease. Mm. And so this is the bit that I'm saying is that that's where I think that we have made a very, very sharp turn away from studying the characteristics of the virus, which is that all you need is an interferon response with this virus, and it will be benign. <sighs> Well, you know, the, 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 there are mechanisms that uh, the virus develops that uh, can also uh, bypass uh, interferon. Mm -hmm. I mean, and also the mucosal, uh, muc mucosal immunity, I'm all for it because uh, it is, of course, uh, at the level, at the, at the, uh, at the barrier, uh, at the, um, uh, the portal of entry, I would say. Mm -hmm. But... Um, Again, I mean, uh, mucosal immunity is not going to prevent immune escape. That is, that is my point. Ah, so, I see. Mm. But, you know, you can compare this with some of these cases that you hear about people who got immunized once, that got infected with the virus and got more severe disease or got severe disease, right? Again, that is also, that is another, an, simply another example, in this case, a vaccinee, 
who has suboptimal antibodies, because obviously a few days after your first injection, you have not a full-fledged uh, immune response that cannot be. And, but you do uh, develop antibodies that are capable of binding to the S protein. So th there is only this kind of explanation that suboptimal antibodies can, on one hand side, suppress your natural antibodies, but on the other hand, uh, are not sufficient to neutralize the virus. I mean, this can explain as well in case of asymptomatically infected people, as well as in people who got just one single shot, why when they are encountering the virus, they are prone to severe or, or, or more, severe, uh, more severe disease. So, but the point I was making was back to your question, uh, what is happening in those countries? Uh, yeah, yeah. Severe, eh? So, so what I'm saying here is that the higher the infectious pressure, right? The mm -hmm. higher, according to this hy hypothesis, the higher the infectious pres pressure, the higher the likelihood that somebody who is just, you know, who just has his antibodies suppressed, uh, you know, an asymptomatically, previously asymptomatic, asymptomatically infected person, the higher the likelihood will be that um, he gets re-exposed to the virus at the point in time where he's still sitting on this uh, on these suboptimal antibodies that are in principle no longer detectable after eight weeks. So if you are, you know, look at these countries, you have a high infectious pressure, you will see that immediately, and some of these countries started vaccinating, as I was saying, when this uh, infectious pressure was mounting. And then you saw, for example, a second wave, also including younger people, et cetera. I'm certainly not saying that this second wave, it was due to the vaccination. Uh, maybe the vaccination to some extent contributed, I could explain this, but basically what happened is they have a high infectious pressure. So pre people that are previously, have previously been infected due to, to this higher infectious pressure have a higher likelihood to be reinfected during the very the, 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 the very period in time where they uh, have antibodies that are suppressing their uh, innate immune response. And hence uh, the virus will break through that innate immunity and that will give ra uh, raise to, a rise to uh, a very serious uh, surge in cases. Now what is now happening in those countries, and that is my prediction, you will see that due to the vaccination, of course, you will diminish the infectious pressure, right? You will, that, that's very logical. The more people you vaccinate, you will diminish the infectious uh, uh, pressure. So, but because the infectious pressure is now diminishing, the likelihood that you will still be able to break through the innate immunity of people who got previously asymptomatically infected diminishes. So now, the infectious spread, the virus will no longer be capable of breaking through that innate immunity, but, but it will still be encountering a suboptimal immune response, which is due to, to these uh, non-functional antibodies. And so so are, you saying, are you saying, therefore, that you would anticipate in these countries where now they've got low infectious pressure, they are going to see a rise in infections in the people who were previously asymptomatic? Yeah, you, uh, Philip, you're going a little bit too fast. Let me first finish the first case. Yes, sorry. So the yeah. guys, high infectious pressure, right? You start vaccinating, you will diminish the infectious pressure. Because you diminish the infectious pressure, the likelihood that the virus will be able to dig uh, into that reservoir of people who have not gotten the disease rate, who got previously asymptomatically infected, will diminish. Because in order to break through that innate immunity, you need a higher infectious pressure. The lower the infectious pressure, the, the lower the likelihood that you will break through this. But the virus in those people will still nevertheless, although it's no longer capable of breaking through that innate immunity, it will still be encountering a suboptimal immune response. And that is where I'm saying if this situation become predominant in, in a number of people and the, the number of people is quite, uh, is quite uh, substantial because remember these people, uh, these countries had high infectious pressure. So there is a large number of people who got asymptomatically infected. 
And since this pool is pretty large and you have a large amount of circumstances uh, where you have the suboptimal immune response, you will now breed, in fact, higher infectious variants. So the higher infectious variants that arise, that, you know, like spontaneous mutations, will be selected by those conditions and will be trained on, this, on these conditions. Why? Because there is a substantial amount of people who are exhibiting these conditions. And what you will see, that is my prediction, is that you will see that uh, the, the infectious pressure goes down through the vaccination, but you will have from time to time, you will still have a small surge. And, and these are the asymptomatically infected people who get the disease, but it will, this, this uh, slope will decline. It will decline till you have a situation really where the, uh, the highly infectious variants have been selected and propagate and start dominating in the population. And there you will see again an infectious surge, a surge of uh, more infectious variants that will then uh, cause, uh, of course, another, um, uh, another peak. Yeah, and, so let, uh, let, me get, let me clarify it because it, 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 I'm trying to see if I can make sure I understand it properly. So you're predicting at the moment that even in places where the infectious pressure has dropped, the UK, um, Israel, um, that they are going to be running at that level for a period of time and then still have peaks later on? Yeah, well, that is the other scenario. So I was still uh, talking about the scenario of the high infectious pressure, right? Yeah. High infectious pressure, the pressure diminishes, likelihood that you will erode the innate immunity diminishes, right? But you will still have some of the smaller peaks. Still, this innate immunity is more or less completely eroded. At that time, at that time, the only way for the virus to still break through the immunity to the immune response is to break through the immune response of the vaccinees. And especially vaccinees who got like one shot, vaccinees who got suboptimal immunity. And there will be plenty of those the more you vaccinate, of course. And then you will have this big surge of infectious variants that are basically capable of overcoming the S-directed, the spike-directed antibodies, okay? Now, hold on. So it, 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 and it's important to try and clarify. I understand that this is a probability. Do you think that this is necessarily going to happen, one? If it's probably going to happen, do you think that it's high probability, medium probability, or low probability? Personally, I'm certain that this is going to happen. So what else could I say? Yes. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm sorry. so now you have you 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 have to compare this to a situation, for example, the UK, Israel, etc. What happened there? There, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they, they the 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 innate immunity got eroded almost completely. Why did it happen? Well, these these countries, especially also Israel and the UK, had a huge peak, right? They had a huge peak. What does that peak do? Well, a number of people got, of course, the disease. They develop um, protective antibodies. So they are fine, right? They are fine. They, they got the disease, uh, develop protective antibodies. Now, because this was a substantial amount of people, the remainder, these are people who are still sitting on a very robust innate immune response that was capable of resisting this high infectious pressure, right? So you brought down the infectious pressure tremendously. So now these countries continue vaccinating on a background of a low infectious pressure. So, but the virus is still encountering again in, in the previous scenario, it took time. It took time till the innate immune response was completely eroded. Here, they are now already vaccinating on a background of low infectious pressure, but the virus is still encountering suboptimal immune conditions. Why? Because an increasing amount of people are getting vaccinated and uh, the substantial amount of them while they are waiting for the second vaccination, while they are developing their, uh, their antibodies, etc., have suboptimal immunity. So the only way for the virus now 
to further replicate and it can easily do this because it's simply encountering in many, many people suboptimal immune conditions, namely the antibodies that are not fully mature. So now the virus will be trained to overcome this, uh, this immune pressure by the vaccinal antibodies. And hence, this will lead to more infectious variants. And this is not to say that the virus is per se resistant, again, you know, and, and all these epitopes do no longer bind antibodies. One has to imagine if you have these highly infectious variants that are developing, they will also develop a high infectious pressure in the population. And we very often forget that it's not just a matter of the, of, of, of the, the features, the antigenic features of the virus, it's also a matter of the concentration of the virus particles. So if you have a highly infectious variant, high infectious pressure, you will be able to break through that immunity. And what I'm saying is that in those countries, you will also finally see, but it will take some time. Why will it take some time? Because in fact, the innate immunity, because of this huge peak, got dramatically uh, eroded. So there is a high resistance. And so now the virus really needs to start from scratch almost to overcome these vaccinal antibodies, but in a large amount of, uh, of, of population of vaccinees. And ultimately, this will result in, in, in a steep uh, incline again of, of cases. So when people are saying Israel and uh, the UK, they are developing herd immunity. Yes, they did have herd immunity after the first peak. And what they should have done, according to my humble opinion, is at that moment in time, they should have done a lockdown, right? To really, to really dilute, I would say, the virus to an extent that it, 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 it could no longer, in fact, find a susceptible, a susceptible host. That so, is not the case when you vaccinate people because then you generate continuously suboptimal conditions. If you, at this point, where the infectious pressure was down after the surge, we know that then people, they sit, for example, eight weeks on their suboptimal antibodies, right? Well, you do a lockdown of 10 weeks, let's say, they get rid of the suboptimal antibodies, which are the reason for training these highly infectious variants. And then you are in, you, you are in an, a much more favorable situation. So I think Israel, and the UK missed the opportunity because should they have done that, they would have been in a situation like now in Australia and, and China, for example, where you have very sporadically a case and you can immediately control it by stamping it out. Well, you do a lockdown for six weeks of 100,000, 200,000 people, and you can again live quite normally. So, 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 so let, me, let me just try and see if I can yeah. get now the future because this is what people are trying to understand because part of the difficulty is that all of the hopes were banked on the fact that we vaccinate and then the world can get back to normal in your prediction is that too optimistic are we anywhere near getting back to normality as we would hope I think with these vaccines, we cannot solve this, Philip. I've, I've reiterated this several times. And the thing is that is so difficult to understand is on one hand side, and of course, I do endorse this, do vaccines reduce the infectious pressure? Yes. And if you reduce the infectious pressure, can you reduce the number of cases of disease in that population? Yes. If you reduce replication, can you reduce the number of variants that emerge? Yes. The problem is that we are dealing with two types of populations. We are dealing with the vulnerable uh, people, you know, for example, the elderly, immune suppressed, uh, you know them. And, we are, and, and the other part of the population is a, a population with uh, a fantastic innate immunity. When the virus comes in, 80 or 90 percent of the people are protected, right? Well, 80 or 90, that's exaggerated, between 50 and 80 percent depending on the demographics and the composition of the of the population. So the question, so what we are saying, or what the, the vaccine, uh, the vaccination mantra would apply 
if we would only have to consider that population, for example, if you do a prophylactic vaccination outside of a pandemic of a certain target population. Now we are talking about a pandemic that affects all of these groups, some are symptomatically infected, other asymptomatically infected. And then the question that you need to ask yourself is, if we vaccinate one of these groups, the target, the, you know, the, the, the vulnerable people, for example, could there be an impact of that vaccination on the other group? And what I was already saying, and this is only the only, the most important question that I would like people to answer is how on earth can you explain? Look, for example, uh, what is happening in the current pandemic. Look what is happening with the flu pandemic in 1918. How can you explain that all of a sudden the virus shifts to a much younger population, right? And that's what we are seeing right now. This younger population, they were perfectly, stayed perfectly healthy during the first wave. So they, they, they were fine. And now we are seeing these healthy people uh, who remained healthy during the previous waves are now all of a sudden getting disease and severe disease, despite the fact no underlying diseases, uh, no, not immune suppressed, etc. How can that be? They must be immune suppressed. Yes, they are immune suppressed because of the high infectious pressure that was built up and that was in fact suppressing, was in fact uh, re-exposing them. These healthy people very soon after they got their previous infection. This is to say at a, a moment in time where they were still having antibodies that were suppressing their natural antibodies. That is the only explanation that you can give to this. And, and so this is a clear example on how vaccination or even, for, you know, for that matter, a huge wave, for example, uh, which is, has a little bit the same effect because it's, uh, of course, also going to generate the high infectious pressure. How this intervention in one part of the population can have a dramatic impact on the other part of the population that, pro that is protected through a different type of, of, of immunity, in fact. And no, that so, is what is not understood. And, that, and as long as we don't talk about innate immunity, as we don't talk about asymptomatically infected people, and when we don't talk about the suboptimal conditions that prevail in those asymptomatically infected people, including vaccinees, when they got only like one shot, eh, we will not be able to understand this pandemic. We will not be able to solve it. And that is what we are currently seeing. A lot of promises, but not not founded on any scientific rational, right? Okay, so so let let because people are people will get scared. People are hoping that we're getting somewhere, and what you are saying is frightening. It's worrying, you know. And and the 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 thing is is that even though you are identifying these issues, what is the solution? Is there, is there even any point in focusing on it if we don't have a different way of sorting it out? Yeah. So, uh, Philippe, as you know, I'm not at all an expert and therefore I'm not going to mention this about, uh, you know, all other types of uh, antiviral treatment, including ivermectin, etc. Personally, I think if we would treat these people on a large scale, prophylactically, that it might also lead to resistance, but I don't know. But in terms of immune intervention, let me tell you one thing. Well, first of all, can we do any? Can we do something? I think we need to distinguish here between the countries that are far advanced in their vaccination campaigns and that have already vaccinated. I don't know over 25 or 30 percent of their of their people and those who have just started and uh, are still at very low uh, vaccination rates. I think we need to distinguish between those two scenarios, just like we would need to distinguish between what do we do with somebody who has been fully vaccinated versus somebody who has not been vaccinated yet, right? So first scenario, countries that have uh, low vaccination rates, 
I think that uh, as long as we don't have any other really alternative in terms of immune intervention, that if those countries would uh, simply, and, and I'm going to be very, very careful with my words because I will be immediately under attack, but I will immediately correct what I'm saying, <laughs> is that, first of all, I think those countries should let a wave go through. But, so that means no infection prevention measures and people get the disease but they should be treated, and that is my correction, they should be treated, please, at an early stage, at an early stage of the disease. So that these people, of course, uh, you know, don't develop severe disease and don't die. Why I'm saying this? Well, this is a principle that is known in, in, in veterinary medicine, for example, where you use this as an immunization strategy. Why? Because if people get a disease and they don't need to go through the full course of the disease, if we stop them in time, they will be primed. And as we know, and I think there is several papers coming out right now and several people raising their voices that the best way to really set the immunological memory for this disease is to have the natural infection, right? You have the natural infection. You, you build antibodies, you will, have, uh, you will have memory, but you prevent these people from getting really severe disease. So, so, now, uh, so, the, so let's, let's explore that because we're already million. almost, yeah, we're almost at 3 million deaths. Would we have to accept numbers like 10 or 15 million deaths in order to achieve what you're talking about? No, because what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that we cannot, we cannot let this disease just go in these people. We need to treat them at an early stage. But what I'm saying, if, if they don't get the disease, if they are simply asymptomatically infected, they will not develop memory. They will not, the, the B cell memory, they will not develop a very solid and uh, sustained B cell response to the S protein, right? So therefore, they need to get the disease, but we need to stop this disease. And that is why it is critical that all these, you know, uh, brilliant people who are working on early treatment, that uh, they get hurt and that this gets implemented. But then if you do this and you can see this, see what happened, for example, in Israel, this gigantic wave uh, that came down. And I was saying not due to, uh, that much to the vaccination because Vaccination had just started on that peak and within a few weeks it was dramatically reduced because people got the disease, developed protective antibodies and the virus cannot go through, through this immunity, cannot break through. And the remainder, they had of course uh, still very solid innate immunity. Then you bring the infection down. Look what happened in Israel. They brought it down within a few weeks in fact and then what you do then then you do infection prevention measures. Then you do a lockdown and you do a lockdown. How long? Well, just to prevent people who got asymptomatically infected, because we are not talking about vaccination, we are talking about natural infection, to clear their suboptimal antibodies. And that is about eight weeks. So I would say a lockdown, but really lockdown for 10 weeks, right? And then I think these countries arrive to a situation which is now prevalent, like in China uh, and, and, and Australia, where they can then just monitor if there is a case, you know, they do a local lockdown and, you know, and the rest of the country can function normally. And that lockdown is limited to, to, to a few weeks. Of so so you even with, even with that, you are saying that we still have to be in a situation where we will still have to do localized lockdowns because of tiny outbreaks. This is therefore going to become endemic. Is that what you're saying? That it's going to be just a part of the routine things that we see longer term? Well, I mean, this, uh, this, yeah, you could say endemic, but um, it is still not, um, not really endemic in a sense that you have few cases, but if you let them go, if you let those cases go, they will grow again. And this virus had the potential to build up again the infectious pressure 
and to become again, you know, uh, you know, a, a huge, a huge problem, as we have seen when we were, uh, for example, at the beginning, we had it relatively well under control. There were no variants. But as soon as we relaxed the disinfection prevention measures, there were again these surges, right? So it's not like a purely endemic virus where you have a little bit of a breakthrough, but everybody else has memory and can immediately reactivate that, uh, that, uh, that memory. So uh, do you think any government would ever risk exposing the population? They would never get voted back in again. And this is a problem, is that at a political level, I just cannot see any there government. Are examples. There are examples. I, I mean, mm -hmm. I should have looked it up before, uh, before the interview, but I'm very well aware of, uh, for example, uh, parasitic diseases in, I think it's in cattle, where you let the cattle get the disease, right? You, 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 they, they become diseased as an, as an uh, immunization strategy, but you treat them. You treat when they get the symptoms, you treat them in a very efficient way, so they won't get ill. Well, they they won't further develop the disease. It will the disease will be immediately abrogated, but they will have this will have given them an, an opportunity to develop a long lasting and a robust immunity. And th this is a very well known practice. Uh, th that is not new, and it has been considered also. Was it with malaria or? Uh, I think of one uh, another, yeah, human uh, bacterial parasitic disease uh, as well. So I think that is that is one scenario. The other scenario, much better, of course, and that is, according to my humble opinion, the only way that we could uh, proceed in countries that have no uh, vaccination rates that are uh, that are. Uh, pretty high and where mass vaccination campaigns are, are pretty advanced. And that is, and I'm repeating all the time myself from the very beginning, I've said so, is to find a strategy for immune intervention that is able to eradicate the virus. And eradicate the virus means that it needs, the vaccine needs to block transmission and to induce sterilizing immunity. And this could have been envisaged at the very beginning of the pandemic where there were no infectious variants using, for example, a, a live vaccine and, uh, you know, a live attenuated vaccine. But now it's not going to hell because if people are already vaccinated and you come even with a live vaccine, it will first and foremost recall the previous antibodies, which are the antibodies of the vaccine, of course. So that is no longer uh, useful, unfortunately. Um, so, but, and, and then there is another scenario that I think for people to protect uh, themselves uh, is, um, you know, to remain, I mean, that sounds weird, I mean, people hate me for saying this, but to remain seronegative, because if you know that your natural antibodies are not suppressed by a specific antibodies, then at least you know that your natural antibodies are, uh, are functional. But whereas youngsters were very well protected during the first wave, they are now much less protected because we have now highly infectious strains. And you have to know, to, to know Philip, and that is something that I've maybe not been emphasizing enough, innate uh, natural antibodies are fantastic they can protect against all types of variants but there is one well there is several but there is one important shortcoming of these natural antibodies they cannot resist high infectious pressure they can do a lot of things uh, at a lot of pathogens but they cannot if one of these pathogens is present in, in a high concentration of highly infectious then they are very often insufficient they cannot sufficiently limit and the, uh, the infection. And that is what we are seeing right now, where with highly infectious variants, even youngsters who are not sitting on blocking antibodies, uh, have not been previously exposed, they could become ill because their natural immunity may have a problem to resist really this highly infectious, uh, this highly infectious variants, whereas initially they were much less uh, infectious. So that means that, you know, 10 particles now, well, 
all of the 10 could enter the uh, susceptible cell, whereas previously, of these 10 particles, maybe one would, uh, would, would become really infectious. So that is a problem, but I think zero the being uh, saying zero negative is uh, is a critical thing. Is a critical thing. So, um, in the midst of all of this, Gert, because we've we've highlighted that you are planning to not really do much more talking about this. No. You have been one of the few voices who was willing to speak about these things and to share your research. Why are you deciding? to go quiet. Are you choosing to be silent or are you being silenced? No, I, I don't think I'm uh, I'm being silent. Uh, I'm, I'm being silenced. Well, well, of course, I mean, uh, we, we get uh, we get censored. Everybody, you know, who talks about uh, these things in a way that is different uh, from uh, what the general recommendations are uh, is is increasingly uh, censored and and uh, and silenced um, that is that is of course very annoying but my main point is that uh, I, uh, from the very beginning from the very very beginning i knew that no matter how compelling the scientific arguments uh, i and and others we are not going to be able to stop this train. I, I'm no longer at my age, you know, so naive that I would believe this. Uh, for me, it's a, a moral obligation, as I said, but at least, Philip, I had hoped, I had hoped that industry or health authorities would have picked up some of my concerns and would have added some elements to the discussion. As I was saying, the likelihood that immune escape variants may increasingly circulate as we continue or as we intensify the vaccination, the contribution of innate immunity, again, the, a new virus comes in, a new virus, nobody has immunity in 80% or 70% or 65% of the people are protected. This is due to natural immunity. It is such an important factor, not taken into consideration. The role of asymptomatically infected people with suboptimal immune responses, a potential breathing reservoir for, you know, for these immune escape variants to, to train themselves and to become stronger and to, to, to replicate and to pro reproduce more efficiently. None of these elements are even taken into account. And then I'm kind of saying, you know, guys, I told it, I said it, a lot of this is on my website. I, I, what else can I do more than this? And, you know, the more I, I speak and the more I post messages on this, I think the higher the likelihood that my credibility will be further undermined. And so um, that is why uh, I think that this is, this is going to be my uh, my last interview and uh, i think time has come to uh, concentrate on on solutions i'm a strong believer into uh, you know since many years and not since the corona i think i because th if you think about it it's not just not corona what do we do if like in two three five ten years our next generation is again encountering another pandemic are we having the same circus as as we have right now I mean, this is just unbelievable. So we need to be prepared and make another type of vaccines, vaccines that are not just using what I call conventional antigens and not doing anything else, not doing anything else than simply mimicking the immune response that is induced by natural infection. And that is directed in this case against highly variable antigens of viruses that are highly mutable. This is in the long term not going to be a solution. We are not going to go anywhere with this approach when it comes when it comes to fighting pandemics of highly mutable viruses. And if we want to protect, you know, as many people as we want, so that that is that is kind of what what mass vaccination is about. And um, and and I will dedicate uh, my time to this because. You know, you can talk a lot. I think it was important to do this, 
But more important than talking, it's it's doing something. Uh, I'm very well aware of this, and I think uh, the the future and the, the next uh, generation and and you know deserves my attention and the attention of others. And uh, if you're not if people are not listening to us anyway, then the only thing we can do is as this, you know, as people will see what is happening and they will remember my words that we maybe have something, uh, something that is, uh, that is ready, right? Because uh, as, as you will appreciate, I'm very much convinced of what I'm saying here. You know, I'm not into theater or uh, drama or uh, sensation or, or whatsoever. As I told you, I never go on social media, but this is a case we, that we will not be able to solve if we continue like this. And I think it, it's very, very clear. Nobody is predicting what is happening. You know, the epidemiologists or the health authorities, they can't even tell us whether the curves are going to go up or to go down, etc. cetera. Uh, so, so it's an impossible situation. And um, so I, I, I think I've contributed the elements that, uh, you know, uh, that I've taken a deep dive into and that I think are, are valid. And uh, if people accuse me of just uh, distributing and sharing this, without uh you know having written any uh, publication uh, that should be peer, re peer reviewed etc uh, then i'm asking them what where are their peer review journals that uh, justify an experiment like this right uh, there is no peer review journals that uh, that that even suggest that this experiment is going to have a happy end. There is no scientific evidence whatsoever for this. And so far, so far, except for some people that, uh, you know, the target group, uh, some elderly people that got vaccinated and did get COVID, but didn't need to be hospitalized, except for that, there is no evidence whatsoever that this strategy is working. What I'm saying is that look at the Seychelles, look at the Maldives, look at Bahrain, for example, where they have huge vaccination rates and where, you know, it gets out of control. I mean, it just, the curves, the ineffectivity curves are, are, are going up very, very steeply. And we will see, everybody will be able to witness and to watch what is going to happen in those countries. Some people will think, well, you know, we increase even further the vaccination rates and we are go going to, to get all these things under control. I'm saying it's not going to be the case, right? So unfortunately, we have come to the situation where I can only say, well, guys, you know, uh, wait and, and see and watch w what is happening, right? I, I had hoped to, to have a more productive discussion, bringing in new elements, having a constructive discussion where we could at least, you know, uh, have a common rationale on how to tackle this best. Now there is plenty of different groups, you know, uh, everybody saying something different. And it becomes for the public, for the broader public, impossible not to get confused and 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 to make sense of of, of this. And that is that is a very very unfortunate uh, situation. But just by censoring people who speak up, come with new insights and and scientific reasoning, just banning these people, just censoring this uh, them, and and just you know uh, exposing them to. Uh, the, the, the most uh, arrogant and incompetent subspecies of our human race, namely the, the fact checkers. I mean, that is not, that is definitely not going to be a solution. That is, wow. that is, that is not a solution. Wow. Listen, um, Gert, this, this again has been a, a pleasure speaking to you. Um, for anyone who wants to know more about what Gert is saying, you must go and look at his website, just um, Gert van den Bosch. And what you will clearly see is that everything that he has said is nuanced. He explains in detail. So if you have questions about some of the stuff that he's, he's spoken about, um, zero negative and so just go and look at his frequently asked questions on the website where he does detailed explanations for a lot of these things. Um, I, I I do hope, Gert, that your voice doesn't get lost at this point, because you do um, stand as one of those people who allows us, who forces us to have to debate the challenges that are in front of us. And um, 
in some senses, I mean, the future that you have predicted looks very bleak. I, I pray that you are wrong. And I'm sure yeah. it's what oh. I, 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 I'm sure that's what you hope as well. But I do understand what you say with regards to the fact that this is what you predicted. And this is what we see happening at different parts of the world. And um, we, we truly applaud you, Gert, and thank you very much for those words you've said and hope that the work that you do in the near future will hopefully bring us closer to a resolution with regards to this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, uh, Philip. And from my side, uh, we should not be hopeless. I, I think this is a very clear signal not just for this pandemic, but for pandemics to come and years to come, to take a different approach and to act instead of just watching what is going what is going to happen. So uh, that is one thing. The other thing is that I will no longer respond to messages on LinkedIn. If people want to ask me a question, they should just uh, drop me an email because, yeah, it is becoming endless, all these uh, 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 messages, etc. So uh, people can still contact me, drop me uh, an, an email. But uh, yeah, I think the key message is uh, let's, um, let's, uh, let's uh, take uh, different approaches and let's also, um, let's speak uh, people who are really doing an amazing job in all the elements that uh, regard uh, early treatment because that is, that is, I think, also a key thing. And in the meantime, while we are doing that, I think we should look for immune interventions that have much more perspective with regard to fighting uh, pandemics, this one, but also potential future ones. Thank you Wonderful. so much again for uh, having me on, on your show. Wonderful, Gert. And just stay with me while we do the Thank you.